This morning we do come to uh, the book of Titus once again. We're studying this powerful little book at the, uh, toward the end of the New Testament. And uh, last week, um, many of you um, on Sunday night and on Monday sent me a message, um, some by text, some by email, um, one by post, where um, the Lord was just dealing with you last Sunday as we looked at Paul the slave, um, the very first opening words of this little letter of Paul's to Titus. He starts by declaring himself a servant of God. And Sunday, we looked at the uh, reality of the word doulos, um, being slave, but he is this slave that is qualified to speak into your life. Well, this morning, we are going to move to the next designation of Paul, and again, we're taking our time to do this because it will have great impact on the rest of our understanding of the book of Titus. So this morning, we look at another word, a key word, um, right there in the first line of this letter of Titus, and it's Paul the Apostle. Um, we are looking at him as a man with a message. So if you would, take your outline there and notice the box on the page. We're going to read the introduction to the letter of Titus. You remember with me from last week um, that it's a good long introduction that's power-packed um, with deep truth. So notice Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Verse 4, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Savior. This morning we look at an apostle. We've had some interesting words come up over the last few weeks. We look at the word epistle, and uh, these aren't words that we commonly use very often, but an epistle is the idea of it being a letter. And as we look at the phraseology of the New Testament, there's, there's actually quite a few different words that we don't hear every day. The word gospel, when we think about the word gospel, we, we either uh, have images perhaps from a long time ago, uh, it's not a word that's used very commonly uh, anymore, but gospel st simply means good news. That is the good news of the Bible, the overall picture of blessings and truth from God's Word. But today we come to one of those words, apostle. What is an apostle? Well, let's remember last week from a few things that we said already. Number one, the greeting, verses one through four, is long and important. We said that last week. There's things here we don't want to miss. So if you're new to us this morning, we want you to know where we were last week. We want you to remember a little bit. It's been proven that if we remember just a little bit as we've had teaching, um, we can water it in and we hold on to it a little bit more. But we would encourage you to read this in introduction, um, being careful to notice what is in it. Um, we'll be talking much more and moving much faster next week. Um, but notice this introduction is important. Number two, Paul is the author and he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. We'll even see that um, mentioned uh, in one of our other passages, supporting passages this morning. Number three, Titus is the what? Recipient, that's right. And he's leading churches on the island of Crete. You remember with me, you can see the map there, the island of Crete is out there in the Mediterranean. Um, we're gonna look a little bit more next week at more why uh, this was an interesting place and why Paul would write what he wrote to them. Cretans were an interesting crowd, and I say interesting in quotes. I mean, they were truly um, an anomaly. Um, Cretans had a reputation, as Paul mentions a little bit, and we're going to see why that was. So Titus had his work cut out for him, and the Apostle Paul knew that he needed instruction and encouragement, and many of those things apply to us even in this day. So look at the next part that is here, number four. 
the author's two-sided credentials that are here. Paul gives his name, and then he's telling why they should listen to what he has to say. He first of all says, Paul, a servant of God. Now, we said last week that the word doulos should be translated slave most of the time. The word doulos should be translated slave. Instead, what is it usually translated? Servant. Now, this is what caused us such a stir in our hearts last week. Many of us have never been challenged to look at the Scripture because all of our English translations went with servant most of the time over went going with slave, and we missed an a incredibly depth con- deep concept within our identity as God's children. Some of you are saying, Pastor Andrew, I, the idea of servant makes makes serving the Lord sound more optional. The idea of slave shows me that I have been bought with a price. I am no longer my own. I have been saved for a purpose. My master wants to use me for his purposes. And the the phraseology is a phraseology that is far more stark and far more intense, but incredibly beautiful when you see it in all proper context. And I would so agree with those of you who have been challenged in that. I have been challenged in that way too. There's, there's quite honestly, when I, when I study to teach um, a passage of scripture or um, a book of the Bible, very often it's not until the preparation for a message do some of the great truths begin to dawn on me and I am learning as you are learning. Steve Brown, the former pastor of Key Biscayne Presbyterian Church, a great church down in, South, or down in Miami on Key Biscayne, said, as a pastor, I typically stayed just ahead of the congregation in what I was learning. He said, so often God was doing a work in me, and it was fresh, and then he would do a work in the congregation. And very often that is the case for me as well. But this idea that we are slaves of God, and that not being a bad term but a beautiful term can only be understood when you begin to look at the whole of Scripture. Um, Over 150 times the word doulos is used in the New Testament doulos, showing us this beautiful depth. Well, there's a second, credi- well, uh, yeah, somebody else mentioned this to me. I got to show you this. When I, was a, when I was a young man, Operation Mobilization just kind of came into my life in a powerful way. I, Operation Mobilization was started by a guy named George Verwer um, from New York, and uh, he, he just had this desire to preach the gospel. He had the desire to share God's word. And he had had lots of trouble in high school, and there was a lady that lived next door to his high school in New York and prayed for the students of that high school and prayed for him, and he became a Christian. And uh, as after he became a Christian, he realized, I got to do something. And he loaded up a pickup truck with as many Bibles as he could, and he drove it from New York to Mexico. And um, that, that, that that was his first mission experience. And before it was all over, he had lots of other students doing things Um, And over the years, that grew, and that grew. Um, There was another college freshman that was affected. I was affected by this. Um, There's my student ID from FSU. A lot has changed, but a long time ago, um, I went with Operation Mobilization when I was a kid, and I thought I was going to be going on board one one of their ships, and I was interested in doing that. But God eventually laid on my heart doing something else. They have two beautiful ships, had two beautiful ships at that time. And this ship was the oldest ocean-going ship in the world at the time. Uh, It has has now been decommissioned. Uh, They've got other ships. But notice the name of the ship. They named it the Dulos. They named it the Dulos because it would carry the Word of God to places all over the world that were impoverished, that did not have access to, to Bibles, some, some areas not so impoverished, but just not having Christian libraries and Christian bookstores. And when that ship pulled, they have a big schedule, the ship pulls into town, there's an advanced team that's waiting on the ship, the vans and the trucks come off the ship, 
There are various meetings that are happening all over the city. People are invited onto the city, and thousands of people come up the gangways, go through the ships, and receive everything from medical care um, to the Word of God, and they can either buy books or they are given books as time goes on. But this great ship was used as a servant. And when George Verwer and the others um, were gaining a vision for the ship ministry, it's called the, ship, the OM ship ministry, they said, what is an appropriate name? Not just for the ship, but to represent us. So after the service last Sunday, Bob Rose came up to me and reminded me. He said, you know, Andrew, I've been aboard a slave ship. I said, you've been aboard a slave ship? He said, yeah. He said, you know, the Dulos. The Dulos. He said, I have people that used to serve on board that ship, and they would say, yes, in completing that picture, it is the beautiful imagery of us being bound to the Savior and in the service of the Savior. And, um, and truly, as we see the idea of doulos, that we are indeed slaves of God. And so now we come to this idea of apostle. And um, we're going to see a stark contrast here as we look at God's word and what an apostle is. So an apostle of Jesus Christ, and you see that's the very next phrase there. What is an apostle? Um, it comes from the word apostolos, and apostolos literally means sent out one or messenger. Fill that in, sent out one or messenger. Any student of the Bible needs to understand this word. Understanding this word will give you insight into the narrative of what God is doing through the disciples and through the early church. We cannot understand much of the Scripture without really looking at the deep words that are used, and this is one of those words, an apostle. It comes from a Greek word, apostelon, or apo, meaning away, and stello, meaning to send. And it has to do with really even stello being a message that is sent. Um, part of the root there would go back to the idea of stylus or pen. So it's a sent word, it's a sent message. Um, it, is, it is one who has been sent with a message. So when, when the apostle Paul says, I am a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, he is saying, I am one sent out by Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at the Bible, we wanna look and see who were the apostles in the Bible? You say, well, I think I can name a few of them, but I bet you, you wouldn't name the first one that is going to be on our list. The first one that is on our list is the first and great apostle. Who is the first and great apostle except, number one, our Lord Jesus Christ? You say, I've never heard of Jesus being called an apostle. What do you mean? They were sent out by him. No. Well, let's look. Let's see Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. And this is important, <coughs> excuse me, important enough. I've included this on your outlines. Notice there with me in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, underline it, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So here it is, the writer of Hebrews is describing the Messiah as an apostle, as one who has been sent with a message. The Bible tells us that Jesus came preaching the truth of God. The Bible tells us that when Jesus came and he was baptized by John the Baptist and he began preaching, he began preaching, you look at it at the beginning of the book of Mark, he said, repent and believe the gospel. So this is the picture of Jesus. Jesus comes, the second person of the Trinity, leaves the halls of heaven, is born into this world, born as a baby, born into, really, a, a cow's stall, into a horse's stall, because there was no room for him in, in, the, in the inn. And in humility, he enters the world in order to show us the love and the plan of God. And then at the right time, he begins his earthly ministry telling us what the Father wants us to know. 
So he comes as a, an apostle, a messenger. Look at the next verse that is there, John chapter 17 and verse 3. Jesus is praying to the Father in this, um, and again, we see his words. Look what he says. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh. That's going to be important. An apostle has to be authorized. An apostle has to have authority. He's, a th he's authorized to give the message. And that's what we see over and over, is that Jesus is authorized to give the message. Look what it says. Authority over all flesh to give eternal life, to all whom you have given him. So the Father is giving children to the Savior that the Savior indeed and fully redeems. Look what it says at the end of verse 2. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, underline it, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is Yeshua the anointed one. That's what Jesus, don't turn your sheet over yet. Jesus Christ means the, the Yahweh God who saves, that's his name, Yesh Yahweh saves, Jehovah saves, and Christ, the anointed one who we were waiting for that would take away the sins of the world. So look what it says. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, this forces us to recognize, especially John chapter 17, verse 3, this forces us to recognize the Trinity. It forces us to recognize the beautiful picture of one God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, perfectly re relating to one another, perfectly harmonious, perfectly together. And yet, we see different persons with beautiful roles, that the Father in his love sends the Son. This is so that we can see the sacrificial heart of God. This is so that we can see the humility of our God. This is so that we can see the tremendous love of our God. In Romans chapter 5, it says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was sent into, into the world to pay for our sins. This is the good news of the gospel. And here we see that the second person of the Trinity obeys the first person of the Trinity in coming into the world. Not, not inferior, um, not in any way less, but in the picture of the fulfillment of God's grand plan. But the, the Son is sent as an apostle. Look at the next page. Safe to turn it over. Not only our Lord Jesus Christ do we see as an apostle, but we see, number two, the 12 apostles. Now, this is, you say, now you're talking, Pastor. That's what I remember. That's, that's kind of what I remember hearing and growing up with and, and hearing even the Apostles' Creed, the, the basic tenets of the faith that these are the ones that Jesus would choose, these are the ones that, that Jesus would choose, perhaps having a, a representation of God's 12 tribes that God is fulfilling his plan of redemption and salvation to the world through the 12 tribes of Israel and then the disciples being, being selected for God's purpose. Notice them being selected, and we find that in Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. In verse 12, actually, I'll back up and see verse 12. It's on your outline. Jesus is choosing his disciples. Look what it says in verse 12. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. This is the second person of the Trinity community, communing with the first person of the Trinity. This is the Godhead, three persons, one, yet beautifully distinct. Look at this in verse 13. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12. So there were many that were following him. Do you see that? When day came, he called his disciples. He said, okay, everybody, come, come on together. They all come together. We don't know how many were there that day. Could have been 40, could have been 400. We know that the crowds had grown. People were really wanting to hear what he had said, was saying. And so from them, he chooses 12, whom he named apostles. Underline that whom he named apostles. 
and Simon, whom he had named Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James and John. So this is Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, this is interesting that God had a plan to set aside these individuals for his purposes. God is always in the work of distinctly working. He doesn't do anything haphazardly. There is nothing by chance. There's nothing by chance in your life that is going on that is by haphazard nature. He is working, and he is in his sovereign work, is pulling all things together, the good and the bad. He is working, and he's moving for his grand purposes. Now, you can either um, come and sit at the feet of his work, or you can resist it or seek to run away from it. I want to encourage you to just come and enter in. Let me, let me remind you that all of these men except John, Christian history tells us, were martyred for their faith. So they had no idea what they were getting into, and they weren't martyred unwillingly. They were martyred willingly. They had come to find that life with Christ is more valuable than life without Christ, even life in this world. It is more valuable than life in this world. They had come to find that it was their, their glad service to not only preach the gospel, but to follow this Savior all the way unto death. You see, that was, listen to this, that was one of the great validations that these guys really believed what they believed is that they were willing to die for it. That is, that is only one of the great validations of the whole thing. We see that God was also working very specially, very powerfully at that time through these men so that the world might know that they were sent by Jesus. Now, in Acts chapter 1, we fast forward. So, so Luke, in Luke chapter 6, that's the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Acts chapter 1 is after Jesus' earthly ministry is finished. Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen from the dead. He's commissioned his disciples, and he has ascended to the Father. And we come to Acts chapter 1 where we see this process that's happening right at that time. Judas, Judas goes, and he commits suicide after he betrays the Father, and we see the replacement of Judas. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 21 through 26, and there's one or two key things to really notice here. Look at verse 21. So one of the men who have accompanied us all during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up. So one of the guys that was with us all along, middle of verse 22, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So these are the guys who were witnesses to the resurrection, that they had seen Jesus. Verse 23, and they put forward two, Joseph, son of Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. Verse 24, and they prayed and said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show us, or show which one of these two you have chosen. Underline that. Which one of these two you have chosen? Verse 25, to take the place in the ministry and the apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. So the picture is, is that here they are selecting these two, and then they come down to say, Lord, we're praying about this. We don't know which ones you want. And then they they come and they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles, making it 12 once again. Now, what I find interesting about that, it apparently both of these men that were with them were qualified to do it. Apparently, both of them had been with Jesus, had seen Jesus risen from the dead. Now, the church is about to just explode out, go out, obey the Great Commission, but yet only one was to be selected. There was a particular purpose and a particular time for these apostles in what they were doing. And the representation of them being 12 was important 
for our understanding of how God is working in the new covenant, that the old covenant, the 12 tribes of Israel are now coming into fruition where we see it is going out into all of the world. Notice here that they go on. What is an apostle? The first ones are, we can say this based upon these passages and others, the first bullet point is, is that they are chosen by Christ. So that's what they were praying for. Lord, show us which one you have chosen. The second thing that we see is that they have seen the risen Lord. It was important for an apostle, if he was going to be an apostle, that he had known Jesus in his resurrected life. He had seen the Lord. He wasn't going to just tell about the Lord. He had not just about that my friend saw Jesus, but if he was going to go out preaching the gospel, being the, the missionary of preaching the gospel to new places and planting churches, it was the plan at that time that it only be those that, were, that would be called apostles, that those who had seen the Lord. Look at the next one. They established and governed the church. We see throughout the New Testament that these apostles very powerfully were establishing the church at a time when there was great upheaval, at a time when many, many different views and many different plans could come in, they were given the authority to um, establish and to govern the early church. Now, in a practical sense, I kind of understand this in a very, very small way. When Marcy and I graduated from seminary, um, we left Fort Worth, Texas, and we moved to St. Augustine, Florida. When we got to St. Augustine, Florida, we began working with a small group that had started gathering to plant a church. It just really started with some Bible studies and some preliminary worship services. It was, it was a rich, sweet time of a brand new church starting. What was so interesting to me and evident to me that at 26 years of age, number one, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, in many, many different ways. I mean, I had been raised as a pastor, but until you become a pastor, you just don't realize what all is going on. So that was one of them. Secondly, I realized that people from about 20 different churches had come together to plant this church. Now, one of the hard things about church planting is, is that you take usually a young guy who doesn't know what he's doing and put them with a bunch of other people that have been gathered from many different backgrounds that have many different ideas. So you're taking inexperienced leadership and putting them into a situation where a great deal of experience is needed. So it's, it's often a prescription for disaster. Um, by God's grace, we made it. And there's a powerful, wonderful church in St. Augustine. Praise the Lord. That's evidence in itself that the Holy Spirit is involved in the affairs of men and honoring his word. But I just remember in the early days of that, um, that, that it was a difficult thing to start a church because so many different people had so many different backgrounds and so many different ideas. And yet, you can't go eight different ways at one time. And then we see here that, this was, that there was the issue of needed authority for that. Thankfully, and by God's grace, the people of St. Augustine allowed me to be their pastor. Um, they allowed me to lead them. They allowed me to love them. They allowed me to, to determine what God was calling us to do together. And that really only happened through staying very close to his word and teaching his word. But notice here with me the last one that's here. They had authority, and this is a mind-blowing one. They had authority to speak and write the words of God. You see, these were very, these were special times that they were in. This was a special era, and this was a special moment. They didn't yet have the New Testament. You remember with me, James wasn't written, we, we studied the book of James last year. James wasn't written for another 12 or 13 years. And so they didn't have all of these letters yet. They didn't have the Gospels yet. They needed people who had seen Jesus. They needed people who had been with Jesus. They, they had heard his teaching. They knew what he was about. They remembered the incidents here and there and the teaching moments that were all throughout those three years of ministry. 
They needed people who were there in the midst of that, and that's what the Lord was giving them. I want you to see Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, and this is on the screen in front of you. It's not on your outline. Notice this. They've been given this special time, and so much so that the Apostle Paul is later writing to the Galatians, and he's saying, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be what? A curse. He's saying, don't believe any other gospel except the one that you've heard that changed your lives. So he's writing back to them. He had preached the gospel to them. He's saying, even if I were to come back and change that, you wouldn't listen. You would let me be accursed. He's saying, I preach to you the gospel. You hold on to the gospel. Look at verse 9. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now, that, what that means is let him be damned. Let him be condemned to hell. That is the picture. So what he's saying is don't listen to anyone that is telling you a gospel contrary. And what was the gospel? The whole book of Galatians is all about the beautiful sufficiency of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. You don't need anything or anyone else. All you need is Christ. Don't add to the gospel. Don't bring in other factors. Don't bring in other um, religiosity. Don't Don't bring in your own ideas to this. Hold on to the gospel. And he's saying... Don't, don't let anyone deceive you because this is the gospel we preach you. Now, this is apostolic message. This is apostolic authority that is here that was necessary at this time. Look at 1 Thessalonians. This is also a beautiful picture um, of this, and this is on the screen in front of you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I think it went up to verse 12, but it says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but what, but for, as what it really was, or really is, the word of God, that is, which is a work in you believers. So this is the picture. He's saying, you didn't receive something else. You received the word of God. We rejoice. When we were preaching to you, we were preaching to you the word of God. We were telling you the truth. And then as you, as you just begin to study through the New Testament, as you begin to see the message that they were preaching, you begin to see that God has set them aside to preach the gospel carefully, to tell it. And, and it's, it's beautiful how it's so consistent in all that is there. And what's really interesting is if you... If you fast forward about uh, 250 years and the councils begin to meet to determine which ones of these letters are truly the word of God and which ones are, you, if you study that process, it is so beautiful how the Holy Spirit was moving and working in the minds and in the hearts of the church leaders to determine, wait a minute, these letters are from somebody who is not reliable, or these letters are preaching a divergent gospel that is not in congruence with the rest of what has been taught. And so even though these letters are out there circulating, this letter is not correct, this letter is not good. That took about 150 years under the leadership of the Holy Spirit that your New Testament was what we call canonized was very beautifully brought together. I have stood in the place where the councils occurred, where that happened in Carthage, that's modern Tunisia. God was working in the early church, affirming and showing over decade after decade after decade what is and what is not his word. And I praise God that now through the ages since then, 1,650 years, 1,700 years, we have this beautiful picture of the New Testament that is reliable and true, that is, that is true to the gospel that Paul was just warning, if anybody teaches you another gospel, you let him be accursed. Those are the, some of the strongest words that could be there. Why? Because it is so, listen, it is so dangerous it is, so, it is so destructive to teach people a false gospel. It, it is so damning to do that, to lead people astray, to lead people away from the truth. That is a condemning thing. We studied the book of Jude, where false prophets would rise up 
and that they, they were told, even then, these guys are here now, watch out. And so we see for the last 2,000 years that we have been dealing with this very issue. So now, what about the Apostle Paul? He wasn't one of the original 12, so how is it that he is an eyewitness? How is it that he has heard the gospel? How is it? In fact, Pastor, if I remember, you told us that the book of Acts tells us that Saul, who was Paul before he was Paul, Saul was condemning the church, and even after Jesus had ascended to the Father, when they came to stone Stephen, Saul stood and was in hearty agreement with that. So how did this happen? Well, I want to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. If you go to Romans, you go, went too far. I want you to see in Acts chapter 9, and we're going to kind of flip through a few of these, so you need your Bible. You know, I want to encourage you, when you come to church, bring your Bible. Um, it really, I mean, uh, bring your Bible. It's worth carrying it. Um, and I want to encourage you to mark in your Bible, to write in your Bible. Um, that's a good thing to do. This is a document. The paper and the ink um, are not... Um, what is supernatural about your Bible, but the truth is supernatural. Um, but I, I just encourage you to bring your Bible to church, and I encourage you to have a good translation that is, is very close to what we're studying, so it's easier for you. That's why we have them available in the bookstore. But look at Acts chapter 9. This is important for us to see. Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to, what is it called? The way, this was the followers of Christ, anyone belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground. So notice this. It knocked him down. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. So this dude, you talk about PTSD, he had it. He was traumatized. The light of God shone upon him, the glory of God shone upon him, and it blinded him and settled him down to where he could listen. Now, Paul was a zealot. He knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was totally about stopping these people that were against the Jewish religion, these people who were claiming to have found the Messiah. And the Lord knew exactly what he was doing, and the Lord called Saul to himself. Look at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. That's a good thing to say when the Lord calls you. Here I am, Lord, verse 11. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus, that's where he was from, named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered and said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. Verse 14, and here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument. Ooh. 
Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the non-Jews, the Gentiles, and kings and the children of Israel. Verse 16, for I will show him how much he will be blessed and have Learjets and Maseratis for my name's sake. Is that what it says? <laughs> For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And indeed he would suffer as he preached the gospel. And listen, God was glorified step after step after step as Paul's faith grew and grew and grew and the message was proclaimed louder and further and stronger in part because of the persecution. You see, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. If Learjets and Maseratis came with the call, wouldn't everybody just kind of be called? Oh, I like your religion. That sounds good to me. Health and wealth and fun. But that's, you guys, let me just say to you, dear church, The picture of the gospel is that we are slaves of God who are going to suffer hardship. Suffer hardship all the way to death very often for his name's sake. So the Lord, in his wisdom, chose yet another apostle. The apostle Paul would come along and say, Uh, oh, how I wish I, I had seen the Lord. Oh, how I wish I had been one of the others. But in his wisdom and in his grace, he knew when I was to be called. So we see the beauty of Paul coming at the right time. So the Apostle Paul, number three, is on the Damascus Road. He sees and he hears and he is called to the Lord. You can read in chapter 2, you can read in chapter 26, you can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you can, you can go on and read over and over again the various places where Paul tells his testimony and where Paul tells of him coming and how God would use him. So, when it comes time for Paul to write to the people of Crete through Titus, Because I I don't believe that Titus got Paul's letter and said, okay, here's the instructions for me, and this is just for me. I I think by evidence of the fact that we even have Titus' letter, that Titus' letter letter was shared. It was shared with the people in Titus, excuse me, in Crete, and it was shared with the people beyond that. In fact, Titus probably said, okay, everybody, this is the way that we're going to, these are the kind of leaders that we're going to establish. This is the doctrine that we're going to establish. This is the living, these are the things that you're doing that are wrong. These are the things that you're doing that are right. Because he was dealing with all of those things. He was dealing with leadership. He was dealing with doctrine. He was dealing with the way they lived. I don't think that he just said that and said, just take it on authority from me. I think he was probably saying, I've been told to tell you this. In fact, here it is. If you're wondering if Paul really said it, here it is. You can read the letter for yourself. And so we we see that that's the kind of authority that is being passed on. That is the kind of authority that that is being projected through Paul to Titus that he would use this. Now, in this present day and time, we need to be very, very aware that there are those, and you need to be aware that there are some who are claiming to restore the apostolic movement. There are many who um, come and proclaim that they have been called of the Lord to do signs and wonders and to do these various things, and, and very, very often we begin to see this this great obsession with the power 
of their preaching or the power of their movement without a careful inspection of their doctrine and without a careful inspection of their life. And that's exactly what happens over and over and over again through human history of the church. Um, that there are different people that come preaching the gospel for certain areas of gain and claiming apostolic authority. Now, as we're going to see here in just a second, we have an apostolic authority, and every sermon that is preached from this place and the overall ministry of this church should have apostolic authority within it, a, an authority that is sent out to preach the gospel. We have been given that in a very beautiful general sense. But to claim that we have first century, before the New Testament was canonized, apostolic authority to do all of these things for these purposes is, is a very dangerous road to go down. And we see it all over the place. Time after time after time, the abuses and the seeking to use the authority, we see that, that Simeon wanting to come and buy the gift of the Holy Spirit, come and wanting to buy the power of the Holy Spirit that he may be able to use that for his gain. Um, oh, the horror of that. So let us look and see. The first apostle, the one sent, is the Lord Jesus to come and to tell and to declare and to purchase us. Secondly, we see Jesus choosing his 12 apostles and then including the replacement of Judas Iscariot. Third, we see the apostle Paul that is called out very specifically for a certain purpose, very dramatically in this day and time, and then used to write even up to half the New Testament. So we see these two great credentials that are, and this is the box on your page, and before you really look at the box, notice the passage of Scripture on the screen. This is for the very first one that we've been looking at. I want you to see these two together. Paul, a slave of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. This absolutely mesmerized me this week as I was studying. Notice these two things compared to one another. Dulos and apostolos. Dulos and apostolos. Look at these. Slave, fill it in, and apostle. Slave and apostle. The first one is broken humility. A slave has broken humility. His will has been broken. He is no longer his own, and he is in abject humility. He is a slave. He has no rights. He recognizes that he is the lowly. And the Apostle Paul is saying, I am a slave to God. But look at the next side. When you look at an apostle, an apostle, one who is sent, he has royal authority. So it's, it's not just humility, it's authority that he also has. The slave is under submission. The slave has been given a life and a task that he must submit to. But it's interesting, when you look at apostle, the apostle is commissioned. That means he is given a task with the master. He is given a job to do. He's, when, when we talk about an officer being commissioned in the United States military, that means that he is being put into action as a leader, as a commander. And here we see that the doulos side is submission and the apostle side is he is commissioned with God. Also, we see that the slave is called to obedience, and the apostle is called to command. These are, these are just radically different things, but yet so beautifully entwined in the picture of what God calls his people to be. That we are called to be slaves, and yet we are called to be messengers. And the beauty in the picture of that is, is truly amazing. Number four, as we close, is this. We see in this, as those who are called to be apostles, in a general way, there is a general call to proclaim the gospel. We are all called 
to proclaim the gospel. Look at the screen in front of you, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. Um, excuse me, I, I think we're only show Acts 1, 8. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Look what it says, and let's read it out loud together and see if you can't hear the commissioning and the power and the authority that is here. Are you ready? Let's read together. Acts 1, 8. Everybody read so we don't have to do it twice. Come on, y'all. Let's do it. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, he, he's commissioned us to do that, and he's commissioned us with power. If we were to read Matthew 28, we would see that Jesus starts that statement with, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go now and make disciples. So what he's declaring is, I have all power, I'm God, I have the authority to tell you to go and do this. And I have the authority to commission you to tell a lost world that I exist, that I love, that I have come, and I have sacrificed that they can know me. And so he, in all authority, declares that we are to go and proclaim his message. In Romans chapter 10, in verse 14 and 15, look at this one on the screen in front of you. How then will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they going to believe if they, in him if they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Verse 15. And how are they to preach unless they are what? Sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And the picture is this. It's not that they don't have calluses and they don't have, what do you call those real hard things on there that really hurt? Corns. Thank you very much. I don't know if you got, my granddad used to sand his feet. Anybody ever see their grandfather sand his feet? He was a barber and he stood there in front of that barber chair just 60 years uh, putting, putting, you know, food on the table and everything else. And I just remember he would talk about his feet, and his feet hurt all the time. And he would sand, I, I, when I, I'd just never seen that before, somebody sand their feet. But, uh, but you know what? My granddad had beautiful feet. And he had beautiful feet because he talked to people about Jesus. Because it's really beautiful when someone shows up in your life and tells you that a Savior has died. It's really beautiful when someone comes and tells you all that pain that you're experiencing, all that difficulty, yeah, it's because we live in a fallen world, but there's somebody who's overcome all of that. That's really beautiful when someone shows up and shares the good news. I recently heard Eli Arias' testimony and how two men from this church showed up at his living room after his first wife had died. And here he had a newborn baby she had died after childbirth. And he had four or five-year-old, is that, is that correct? Four-year-old. And two men came, and they shared the gospel with Eli that day. Eli would say their feet were beautiful because that night he prayed to receive Christ. He prayed the prayer that they had encouraged him to pray. He came to the gospel. He realized a Savior has died for all of my pain. And his life was changed. Instead of continuing in alcoholism, he was set free from alcoholism. Instead of continuing in all of the sorrow and the hardship of having lost the wife of his youth, God comes and begins to bind up the brokenhearted and heal. You see, those are beautiful feet. Now, I don't particularly think Colvin Pinkerton has beautiful feet, but Eli thinks so. <laughs> because those feet had brought the gospel. To us. You see, we're commissioned to take the gospel to a lost and dying world. Layman, preacher, mother, teacher, whoever you are, if you have the good news, we have been sent, we have been sent out for this mission. Look what it says there and fill this in. In a very real sense, all true Christians have an apostolic sent out mission and message. Now, it is different than the 12 apostles and the Apostle Paul. It is, it is not exactly the things that were going on there in the establishment of the church before the Word of God had been compiled and brought together. It, 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 
I don't think that you expect me to stand up and say, this is the word of God, I have a new word for you, and I'm going to declare something that's different and not congruent with what has been said. Hopefully, you would take me out and throw me in Sheridan Street, I, I hope. Because that is, what it says is, let him be accursed. That is an anathema. But what God has called us to do is to hang on to the gospel, and not only to hang on to it, but to give it away. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20, and we will close. Maybe God is calling some of you right now to this realization in a way that you've never thought about this before. I want you to see this. Verse 18 says, all this is from where? All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, them praise the Lord, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. You see, that's authority. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, he is saying we who are in Christ are God's spokesmen to the world. We who are in Christ have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We have been given the word that can help your neighbor in all of his pain, in all of his hardship. Help your son, help your daughter to see that there is a God that cares and has grace and that there is a God that will change them from the inside out. You see, every member of God's family, it's every member is a messenger. We have all been made messengers of the gospel. So in that regard, we can relate to Paul's great calling and to Paul's being sent out. And so as we study the gospel through the book of Titus, we see that, number one, Paul did have a special command and a special authority, but it was a special command and a special authority that is translated to us in the grace and in the love of Christ. Would you pray with me?